Welcome to the show. This is the Magician and the Fool podcast, and we are on episode number 45. My name is Dominic, and my fellow co-host's name is Janice. You will hear from him after this intro. In today's episode, we talk to artist, author, teacher, and returning guest, Mr. Nicholas Schreck. It's always such a pleasure to have Nicholas on the show, as he is full of unique and pertinent insight. This being our Halloween episode, we will be discussing the liminality of the season and the liminality of mortality. I highly recommend you go back and listen to Nicholas's previous appearances on the show, episode number 33 and episode number 21. Before we start our conversation there will be a song of Nicholas's called Calling You From Afar and then we will jump into our topics before we get started I just want to say that we do touch on a lot of Buddhist ideas, Nicholas is a practicing Buddhist and so for anyone who is interested in Buddhism and doesn't know where to start as there are many, many resources and a plethora of books, it can be a little bit overwhelming. I would recommend a book called The Heart of the Buddhist Teaching by Thich Nhat Hanh. It's one that I've had for at least 20 years, and I recommend to anyone who's interested in the topic. It covers all the basics and will give you a nice foundation, starting with the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path, as well as the Three Dharma Seals, the Three Jewels, the Four Immeasurable Minds, the Six Paramitas. As you can see, Buddhism loves its lists. I just want to say thank you, as always, to our Patreon supporters. You really do keep the lights on here, so we appreciate it immensely. If you'd like to be a supporter, just head over to Patreon and sign up. We also thank everyone who has given us ratings and reviews on all the different platforms, whether it's YouTube or iTunes or whatnot. That is also greatly appreciated. We dedicate this to Hermes and Asclepius, and may the merits we accumulate doing this work be distributed to all sentient beings, so that they, together with us, may equally realize awakening. I'm 
We are extremely pleased, excited, and honored to have former guest of the show, Nicholas Shrek, back on. can't believe it's been uh, three years since we have been getting together for our Halloween episodes. We 
appreciate it very much. Uh, welcome back to the show, Nicholas. Yeah, welcome. My pleasure to be your Halloween spook again. Um, yeah, and and what's most amazing about the three years is the is the bizarreness of two of those years uh, being during this plague era, and how and how metaphysically strange that has been. So that's why it seems like more or less time has happened since then. In some way, it seems like a century. Mm-hmm. In another way, like a week. But the pandemic has certainly, at least here in Germany, where I, I know in America, half of you. Uh, don't have a pandemic because it's a it's a hoax but here (laughs) here it happened and we had a very strict lockdown so it definitely shifted the uh awareness of time yeah absolutely if if we would have talked about last year that we would still be going through this i i would have found it hard to believe but here we are yeah i i know that at that time i thought oh we're we're probably getting we're drifting out of it now but it seems as though we've slid into a alternate reality timeline a, a dystopian the just the, the the foreword to a dystopian sci-fi novel by philip k dick that was never published absolutely yeah j yeah jg ballard and philip k dick got together in the afterworld and wrote this <laughs> novel that we're in yeah seriously i mean i look all around and i see more and more of of these of of, of these things and i'm thinking well does it all have to be quite so prophetic Yep. Well, this is the future everyone said to watch out for, and nobody nobody took it seriously. But in either case, in either case, this is the Halloween episode. So um, we had discussed that we shall we shall talk about what is what after all is central to Halloween is death. What what was the ancient Celtic tradition was to leave. I mean, actually, to put it in a spiritual context, to leave. I mean, the, the, the secular Western capitalist tradition of buying candy to give out to, to creatures that look like creatures of the night and ghosts and the dead, revenants of the dead, the living dead, um, that was basically what happened with the ancient Celtic Halloween, but it was completely different because you wore a mask because there was fear of the dead coming for you and you wanted to be disguised. So the mask was not a, you know, a joyful costume party. It was to to hide your identity from the dead and you were bribing them with the the treats that you left for them. And that's not really I mean because western people don't really have much of a spiritual tradition anymore. Of course in any metaphysical system where you're dealing with discarnate entities, you leave offerings for them. So basically, this was on the on the night in which the veil between the living and the dead was supposedly the thinnest, and and spectral beings came into this world. Um, human beings, mortal beings, were were hiding themselves behind a mask, so they would not be taken and bribing these spiritual beings with treats, and that's that's where we've inherited our holiday. Of Halloween, but the useful thing about Halloween, in an initiatory sense, is that while any serious initiate should be thinking about death and mortality, uh, this at least reminds secular people who may have no spiritual awareness of spiritual metaphysical matters, even if it's in the most frivolous, uh, you know, pop culture manner. At least it brings it to mind. And central to it all, really, and that's why the Day of the Dead is the day after Halloween, is to, it's, a, it's a moment to take death seriously. And before we begin, I just wanted to ask your listeners to, to put this in the right context, to imagine for the moment their death. Imagine the moment of death before we begin discussing it and thinking of the finality of losing everything. Everything you've done, everything you own, everything you are, your physical body, all the people you know, the people you love, the people you hate, and even the experience of this particular world that we're in, which is, as I will explain, just a temporary illusion that has been created by the coming together of certain 
causes and conditions. So, so rather than just looking at this like, well, here's this nutty guy talking about some theory, experience and think about your own death and what does it make you feel? How, how do you feel about your own death? How do you feel about not being here? Um, so I think to take a moment to do that is important to understand this is not just an entertainment this is a real experience and it's the key experience that any initiate of any tradition should be thinking about very well said Nicholas something that just popped into my mind do you feel that even sometimes the people that seem to take this holiday seriously don't even consider those very important things Uh, I, I know that in the occult world, the dead and the spirits are a big part of practice and life. But thinking about those things that you were saying, the attachments specifically, um, those are kind of paramount, I think, to when we're talking about death, because those are the things that are going to really affect the outcome. Yeah, well, I definitely, I think there's a certain level in Halloween of probably the majority of people who celebrate it, and I, this is something I've noticed about aficionados of horror and the macabre and of gothic culture, there's a certain amount of them that are actually frightened of the genuine supernatural. Right. And they're, I've, I, I've never felt that way, and I actually feel quite alienated from people in that field very often because, of course, I have always been attracted to it, and took it for absolutely real. But there's a certain amount of people attracted to the macabre and the gothic, whatever words you want to use for this phenomenon, and who who are using it to, to assuage their fear of it by saying it doesn't really exist. It's just fun and games. It's just dress up. It's just costume. And, and very often people who are involved in the horror field are the first people to be atheists or to say there's no such thing as supernatural beings or life after death or the very things that they write about. And I, and I think, yeah, there's a lot in Halloween and in the whole phenomenon of people using fear for pop cultural entertainment, there's certainly a degree of defense mechanism of, of making light of it so that they don't have to face their genuine dread and terror of the unknown about death. That Halloween, to a certain extent, for people even who are totally obsessed with it, they're using it to to nullify or numb their fear by turning it into something celebratory and joyful, but they wouldn't want to go to a morgue and look at real Mm -hmm. dead people. Of course, there are other people who are, you know, pathologically sick who are only interested in the physical uh, corpses and that kind of thing, which borders on necrophilia, Mm -hmm. you have that extreme too. Um, But on a metaphysical level, for a genuine spiritual practitioner, death should be the first thing you should be thinking about because we, and I think that the first subject we should ponder, as I said at the beginning, to consider your own death, your real physical death, not just in some romantic, theoretical, philosophical way, but your, you know, the lose, the ebbing of your vital force and your death and, and your burial, your cremation and, and your general and gradual being forgotten by the people you know, becoming a memory and ultimately the traces of your life being gone, which will happen to all of us one way or the other, no matter what we've accomplished or what we've done or what our ego thinks is important, there will be a total nullification of what our physical being did in this very temporary world. And then also to set the stage for that, the very universe that we're in is dying at this very moment. As astronomers and physicists know, it's the universe is pulling apart. The Big Bang that created it is, you know, slowly the universe is pulling apart. Eventually our own sun will not exist. It will become 
a supernova and a black hole and and the conditions the very fragile tentative tenuous conditions that allowed life to form on this planet will end you know and within from the diva loka level from the cosmic level this the whole existence of the milky way the solar system the universe all of it is just a second less than a second so above and beyond our physical death of our body think of the death of the entire universe the world system to use the tantric buddhist uh, phrase for it that we live in but the important thing to keep in mind even when your physical body is gone and when the sun is gone and when this universe is gone and the planet is dead and their mind will continue and this is the most important and essential um, aspect of this that I want to reinforce on your listeners consciousness itself never dies so to a certain extent there is no such thing as death there is the death of physical form and matter but consciousness never began and will never end and that's very important then to understanding what should we do with this dreamlike existence that we have to use the Heidegger phrase been thrown into into this universe without asking to we have come into this mortal realm of being which is called the desire realm in the Vajrayana system because human beings are always longing and yearning and desiring for something to fill the sense of dissatisfaction that is uh, endemic to samsara so you know that's the most important thing to understand to a certain extent the word death is a misnomer because consciousness always exists so from that we can kind of segue into the this concept of the bardos if you want to unless yes. other questions arise I have a couple of thoughts here just to contribute a little bit. This is what you're describing is, is it's, it's so poignant and important. And it used to be more consistently part of culture. I mean, Memento Mori was a huge part of European culture, for instance, for a very long time. Um, I think it was amplified during the Black Death period and then became integrated to such a degree where the hooded figure of the Grim Reaper became uh, sort of ubiquitous. Um, But now we have this obsession with youth culture and this idea of the eternity of the image, of the eternity of the flesh, that seems to also be propagated by the media, by Hollywood. And it takes people further out of exactly that very essential point you're making, which is the impermanence. Well, every, everything about hyper-capitalism and consumer culture is about selling... Well, there's this phrase, uh, impossible way of being. is a translation from a Sanskrit phrase. Consumerism, Hollywood, advertising, the American way that has infected you know, the entire Western and Eastern world, for that matter, is all about creating an ideal permanent youthfulness permanent you know never aging never declining every product is better new and improved nothing nothing is impermanent it's it's achieving a a phony concept of permanent perfection that cannot exist and that's what's constantly being sold and then on on the the level of where we are in the kali yuga the internet and social media of people presenting idealized, perfected, filtered versions of themselves that have almost, where the avatar of themselves has become more real than the person who is projecting that avatar. That is like a, a mass dementia, a dementia and lunacy that is, is bringing people even further away from the concept of impermanence. And don't you think it's almost insidious how the term avatar is being used in this context for something that's actually taking people further into the illusion, whereas a true avatar 
is the opposite of that, and it leads them to liberation. Yes, I've I've thought of that. That it's almost blasphemy. That I mean, Avatar in in the Eastern traditions and in Tantric traditions, and I, I literally, literally uh, I mean, for instance, the Buddha in in the Vedic and Hindu traditions is actually considered the avatar of Vishnu or you know an uh, ordinary person could be the avatar of Kali uh, and now yeah it's been like everything but this is the nature of the Kali Yuga to degrade transcendent metaphysical spiritual concepts into, into almost the complete opposite of them so a phony avatar on the internet as you say is it couldn't be more of the a total dichotomy from from being the physical incarnation of a deity, which is what an avatar actually is. But that is the upside down world of the Kali Yuga that we live in, where almost everything is the opposite of what it should actually be. But that that's a that's a salient point. And then even there, then radical inversion actually becomes an act that is positive, an act of of grace because we're we're turning against the tide of this downward spiral well that is that is necessary for for the warrior uh initiate in the kali yuga to to be against i mean to in, to a certain extent you have to accept this world system is in decline and and maybe before we get into the physical death and what happens to the human body and the mind of a mortal being, uh, we have to understand the larger context of what we're in. Just like winter will come, now we're in fall, but winter will come, the Kali Yuga is part of a cycle. Uh, there has been a golden age, which there is no trace of it within the Kali Yuga, because it's gone. But when the Kali Yuga ends, many, many, many thousands of years from now, a new golden age will begin, and then it will decline again, and then the Kali Yuga will come again. So it's not like the Christian apocalypse or the Odinic Ragnarok that happens once. The world doesn't end once. It ends over and over again, exactly as we do, exactly as everybody listening to this Every human being, every flea, every frog, every dog, every cat listening to this, we have all gone through the process of birth and death beyond comprehension number of billions of times for billions of years, beyond even the capacity of the human mind to absorb how long that's been happening. So, yeah, it's, so even though we're in a period of decline, the decline will eventually become a period of transcendence but that's ultimately futile that's why it's samsara it's it it goes nowhere it will keep revolving and revolving and revolving around and we physical beings will keep unless we understand the essence of mind and understand how to become enlightened and liberated which are not just lofty words but an actual process that can occur through training of the mind and, and spiritual practice, we will keep returning to this universe in different forms, in different levels, different worlds, different aeons, different completely unimaginable forms that human beings are not even aware of. We will keep returning to this cycle of samsara, of suffering, which means we will be born, we will get old, we will get sick, and we will die which are the four things that the Buddha said are characteristic of the six realms of being. Now, most people fear death and, and think that it's a good thing to come into this world. To a certain extent, it is, and this is called the noble human birth. We are lucky to a certain extent and have a measure of very good karma to come into this realm of being we could have been born in the hell realms we could have been born as a hungry ghost we could have been born as an animal and i'll explain too even the higher realms are not ideal to be born into of the demigods the gods and and the transcendent bodiless realm above that um in the human realm we have 
it is the only place where we have the capacity to have enough suffering and enough pleasure to have time to contemplate the meaning of our existence and to train our mind. It is in the hell realm you have complete suffering all the time. In the God realm, it's like people who are born into immense wealth never have any challenge. They, ha they have everything they need so they don't have to try to develop themselves. You can com you make that metaphor. Um, here in the human realm, we have an ele element of suffering and dissatisfaction, but we also have the leisure time, some of us, to contemplate metaphysics and the, the meaning of life and you know how, how to understand consciousness in the mind. In all the other realms, we can't do that. So as a general introduction to the context and situation that we're in, but then to, to uh, yeah, unless you have any other thoughts on that, we could get into the bardos themselves and the pro maybe concentrate on the process of death that's appropriate to Halloween. I think this is the perfect segue to that point. So let's talk about the bardos and let's start maybe simply with just a definition of what the term means for our listeners who are unfamiliar with Buddhism and Eastern thought. Right. And in, in, in the context of this discussion we're having, I'm going to try to avoid Sanskrit and Tibetan phrases which tend to exoticize or romanticize or at least aestheticize things that are very clear and easy to understand if you put them in simple lay language. So the bardo basically means a time between two things and a, a more graceful way of translating it could be a threshold or a liminal experience it is it is a, it's a gateway between one process of being and the other and you can you can uh, define them as six or four and then there's even sub levels but I'm going to try to keep it streamlined and simple now I think I think kind of like this is some a problem that Theosophy and Madame Blavatsky have created with her misunderstanding and simplification of Eastern terms, which sort of infected all of occultism and New Age and metaphysical thought and, and Western mysticism. Kind of like when people think of karma, automatically don't you think of negative karma? People usually say, like on the most simple, vulgar level, something bad happens to someone you don't like and you say well that's karma but very rarely do people think of positive karma that that you you accrue positive karma people think of karma as a punishment and my general feeling in talking to people about this often is that when you say bardo they think it only means death they think i mean i think maybe they even think it's a synonym for the afterlife state wouldn't you say? That, yes. That seems to be the general. So the important thing to understand is what we are in right now is a bardo. It is the bardo of living. And this bardo of living is, is an afterlife state. That's maybe the first thing to contemplate. We are now experiencing the afterlife of who we used to be before us. The person who died, who we then were reborn from that that mind, like a like a the flame of a candle going out, but being moved to another candle, that used to be us. So we are this bardo of living is in fact the afterlife of the last being we were, and like an accordion that stretches back a billion years or beyond. We are, we are we are just one in a long succession of beings, not even all human, who have continued to take form and incarnate into the various six worlds of being. So I, I think people tend to think the Bardo is the death realm, and here we are in something like the normal, ordinary, regular realm. But that is that shows you the extent of our illusion and our hallucination that we're in from our ignorance, literal ignorance of the way reality is, this bardo is 
is the you know this is the afterlife that people people will say I don't believe in an afterlife, but we are now living somebody else's afterlife. And uh, another way to look at that, when when people have a new child, an infant or a baby, they look at it as a tabula rasa, like oh look at this wonderful innocent new being. But it's important in a very real sense to understand that a, a newborn baby is somebody or some being who died 49 days earlier, for the most part. There are, there are exceptions and anomalies, but for the most part, 49 days before that baby was born, uh, or before they were conceived, rather, not the nine months, before they were conceived, they were somebody who died. So every you know, newborn baby you're looking at is looking around confused and screaming and crying for the most part, though some have the karma not to do that. Um, that's that's a reanimated corpse is a certain way that you mm-hmm. could look at that. It's 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 somebody who recently died and in their in their infant mind they are closer to the person they were than the person they're going to become for a very brief time they will even have memories to a certain extent of that person who died or at least the physical body died the consciousness is obviously returned in a new form and there have so, been case studies on this too where um, children who have these memories are are interviewed by by scientists by uh, psychologists sociologists they follow up on the information and they end up finding that the person that the child is describing had a, an actual discrete existence and was an identifiable personality that had no connection often to their current family and the child. There's no way the child even could have known any of this the, information. Yeah, yeah the, uh, could be in another historical period, another language. Uh, and of course, in the West, people try to come up with a scientific explanation for that in the tantric tradition and the pan-Indian tradition of all the various spiritual systems in in the Indian world uh, and the Tibetan world where the Indian traditions transmigrated, um, that's completely normal to be able to identify who somebody mm-hmm. was. I mean, even lay people, the tradition of knowing, oh, you know, and very often people do reincarnate back into their families again and again in different forms. So the father dies and com- could come back as the daughter of the child of the father. Or you, you could come back as a family pet, you know, depending on your karma. So for the most part, people do tend to reincarnate into a constellation of people they've already known. But yes, it, c- it can be completely unpredictable and from, from another planet, another culture, another dimension. Uh, I, I just wanted to say I also think it's useful, even though this is coming more from a Western esoteric perspective, seven, 49 is an interesting number because seven is the number of Saturn, the Lord of Karma. And seven, 49 is seven multiplied by itself. So you're, you're, this is a process of seven cycle, seven karmic cycles in the afterworld and as far as i understand it time in itself is experienced very differently when one is discarnate oh completely i mean that's that's an important point i mean i do want to get into the specifics of these various bardos and so we don't lose track of that but yes time is completely contingent on having a physical body Mm -hmm. that we know is dying time and death are actually completely married together when our spirit when our consciousness leaves our physical body time is something completely other time only has meaning and context within a body a mortal body that's going to die when the spirit and consciousness are free of matter what is time exactly so even when we say 49 days it's kind of like saying 49 days according to earthly mortal standards when you when your consciousness experiences that time frame it doesn't feel like that it it's you're right it's completely different 
and I, I mean, and we can experience that. Now, another Bardo state like this, the important thing to understand, this Bardo state that we're in now that we call life is just a state of consciousness. It is not an actual reality. It feels like a reality, and that's why it is so tricky and, and why it's such a tempting illusion to keep coming back into. Um, but it, it is only a different level. The, one way you could look at it, it is, it's like a dream. It isn't exactly a dream. And then another bardo state is the bardo of dreaming. And the bardo of dreaming is a little bit moving towards the bardo of death. When we sleep and dream, for instance, if you can remember a dream that you had recently, if either of you can describe one, what were you doing in that dream? Well, I had, a, I had an interesting dream the other night. Actually, that kind of ties into to what we're talking about. I had a dream of uh, my grandfather and my grandmother. My grandmother had recent, has recently died within the year, and uh, I had a dream mm -hmm. that they were together, and we were actually uh, incinerating my grandfather's body. This sounds weird, maybe, but... Um, it was like they were saying goodbye, like he was moving on from whatever place he was at, even though he had already been mm -hmm. passed on for quite a while. She was kind of newly right. passed on, and we were at sort of a funeral for him where the body was being incinerated and they were saying goodbye. Um, I was just an observer, but uh, it, it was definitely interesting in the context of what we're talking about. Yeah, that totally, totally appropriate and ties into this. So... The body that you were watching that happen, that, you know, when you're in that dream, watching your grandfather be incinerated or being with your recently deceased grandmother, it feels totally real to you Correct. when you're in the dream. You know, unless you're in a lucid dream, and unless you've trained your mind to recognize the dream bardo, when you're in that dream, you are 100%, you are that body. Now, here where we are, we also have the very strong illusion that this body that we have is mm -hmm. us. Now, the dream bardo body, that is, that is a form of the death body. That, and if you, if you can imagine that, when our spirit leaves our physical body and we begin this 49-day wandering in the bardo of, of it's literally called the, the painful bardo of death. That's the formal name for it. We will have a body that is like that dream body. It's not real. It's not physical. But we will, through our attachment to this form, we will see ourselves as we were at, our, at the height of our health and um, vibrancy. So if, you know, if someone dies when they're 90 years old, and they, their spirit leaves their body, they will look at when, they, when their spirit leaves and is in the bardo of death, they will not see their 90-year-old withered, weak body. They will see themselves at whatever the height of their vibrancy was. That's interesting. That was actually the case in this dream as well. My grandparents were their younger selves in the dream um, when they were together. And it's interesting for me, my experience with these kind of dreams is that life and death don't really aren't the same like I, I can meet someone who has died in the dream and I it's almost like you forget that they died that death is irrelevant well they didn't to a certain right. extent I right. mean there there as I said there's no such thing as death and that that kind of ties into I think it's important because a lot of westerners and even strangely secular westerners have it like what one funny phenomenon I noticed, probably because I'm a musician, whenever a musician dies, completely atheistic, secular people who never think about it, the afterworld or the spiritual consciousness, um, you know, like some, some rock and roll person ODs, and no matter how miserable a life they had and how tragic and how you know, how decadent and, and, and whatever negative karma they had, they imagine them going to some gigantic jam session with Jimi Hendrix and Kurt Cobain and Brian Jones and Janis Joplin and these other drug addicts and drunks as if those beings 
would go to some heavenly realm of consciousness and would be would still be themselves that elvis would be would still be elvis in in an it's like it's almost a folk religion Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> and I don't want to segue too far into this, but I have so many thoughts. I mean, this this fetishization of these figures by the by that wave of the of the boomer generation is um I mean, it's abhorrent to me to be honest with you. It's it's become so banal and so hypersaturated in western culture this constant attempt to grasp and hold on to with a death grip the, the the fleeting apparition of a brief period in their youth which is kind of connecting mm-hmm. right back to what you're talking about yeah I, th- I think it isn't really a digression i think that's actually what is the real you know if you really measured what do, what does the average person in the western world ever think about death it's when some celebrity that meant something to them in their youth died it scares them because it, it reminds yes. them of their mortality and then they idealize and romanticize the very often sordid or, or frankly stupid, deaths of these you know Jim Morrison, you know ODing in a bathroom and then being hidden and and sneaked out of a nightclub and put in a bathtub, and then they glamorize that or you know you could use a billion other situations Amy Winehouse and and you know it goes on and on James Dean Marilyn Monroe, this is a cult of death. That is very, it's very much a part of, of like folk culture, and and I think it's because people have lost the gods or lost any spiritual beings that they use as role models. Then these neurotic celebrities become quasi gods that they worship because they died young. You know, Marilyn, James Dean, Elvis, etc. This pantheon, but who were these people? Were you know extremely tortured fucked up people not really not people to idealize people who died in horrible ways usually from their own um ignorance or drug addiction so right. and then and then so we make them into immortal heroes and that you know that's definitely a samsaric upside down wrong kali yugic way to look at death i think you hit the nail on the head when you were talking about fear earlier because it is kind of this this artificial immortality created by this capitalistic machine because we're always running from that fear of of death and so to kind of immortalize these these figures is is kind of putting a band-aid on the whole thing absolutely yeah and the, and that ties in again to the the everyone turning themselves into you know, Andy Warhol's prophecy has come true in the most hideous, nightmarish way of of everybody having their little platform of being a quasi celebrity um, as an avatar and and trying to create some artificial doppelganger that is perfect that will be immortalized like like this pantheon of secular gods. The society of the spectacle. Yes, exactly. So anyway, to get more directly to what will happen, so we're in, we are in this state of consciousness that we consider to be living, but really think about it, and this is, this is still the echo of somebody else's death. We are, you know, somebody who we used to be wondered what will happen when I die. Well, this that we're experiencing is who, who we used to be, this is it. This is their afterlife. Now, when, when are what what? Oh, well, maybe we need to get to how do we get born before we can discuss how do we die. When we are wandering, the last person we were when we died, wandered in this threshold state called the bardo of of the painful bardo of death, and unless they were a spiritually realized person who had been meditating and who had been taught by an experienced teacher what is the essence of mind and how to recognize the mind and and this cliche that may be the only thing people may know about tantric buddhism to go towards the white light to the clear light which is consciousness that is that is actual what is called the dharmata, that is reality as it is, without any obscuration or any elaboration. Um, 
if you haven't been trained to do that, and if you haven't spent your time on this earth training yourself to be ready for that moment of death, which is a wholly positive and good thing. There's nothing wrong with the consciousness leaving the body if we understand what to do at that moment, which we can learn to do, and that is the process of initiation. But if we have never learned to do that, as most people squander their very brief time on this earth, only with worldly distractions. You couldn't even call them worldly pleasures because a lot of them aren't, you know, pleasurable. But totally taking this sensory phenomena that this physical world gives us as real and never ever thinking about the inner metaphysical, spiritual, or transcendent, then when death comes, it will be extremely frightening because they will realize they never were that person that they thought they were. And it will be like waking up from a nightmare or a dream and seeing that, that this whole life that we had, you know, it's, it's just as fragile and temporary as, as a soap bubble dissolving. But then consciousness will remain. And they will still have, like in a dream, this dream body, this subtle body they will look down and see their recognizable body as they were at the height of their strength and they will not realize they're dead for a while and i did touch upon this a little last halloween but it's probably important to uh to mention again that that you know there are ways to know that you are dead and it's you know it there, there could be people listening to this and, and you need to be aware of this that death can come at any moment. So somebody listening to this is going to die soon and needs to know that when your spirit leaves your body, unless you're trained to recognize the signs, you'll be confused and you will you'll look at your family or your friends or your wife or husband or your pet or whoever, whatever you're familiar situation your your recently deceased body was in you they will be like on a twilight zone episode you will be trying to talk to them or communicate with them and they will not be able to hear you because you don't realize you're dead yet that's one of the first things that happens when when you go through a process of death which i haven't gone into yet but when you reach that state of having this threshold bardo body that looks like your younger more vibrant self or wherever you were at the peak of your life you will try to communicate with your loved ones or even if not your loved ones if you if you die in a hospital or on strangers you will they'll try to tell the nurses you're here what are you doing but you don't realize you're dead unless you you've already been trained to recognize it so that's very important to keep in mind I think that's a very compassionate thing for you to bring up to our listeners. And the Tibetan um, way is, is very beautiful in that they have a very uh, specific protocol for for after someone dies. And they are doing that that very compassionate thing where they are sitting with the body for multiple days and saying, hey, hey, by the way, you're dead, remember? And here's, yes. yeah. here's what and you I, need to I, do. I have to point out that... That is a great deal of my work as a spiritual teacher. Um, and actually during the pandemic, or actually when the pandemic began, not never to do with COVID death, strangely, but with many others, there, there have been, I've had to do that many mm-hmm. times. And dealing with illness and death and the, and the gradual passing of the life force is a big part of what I do. So I've, I've had to be in many hospitals and, and funerals and you know, dealing with corpses and telling them that they're dead. And and not so long ago, uh, you know, I think, yeah, in the last decade, there was, a, and this is very appropriate to Halloween, but it's not spooky in a fun way, and that's important, too, to understand. Uh, there was a experience, which I'm not going to go into great detail about, where I had a dream many years earlier of someone I knew very well that a relative of theirs died. And it was a poetic, metaphoric dream, but I knew, and I hadn't seen this person, but I had the dream, okay, their relative died. And then many years after the dream, I happened to write it down, 
and that person and I were in contact and I communicated this dream and it happened the dream happened around the time that this relative of theirs died upon my telling them about the dream the ghost of that person materialized here in Germany with me with someone else I know and materialized in America with the person whose relative it was wow and and it was malevolent and frightened the feeling of this spirit and it was visible very visible and recognizable and I went to the grave of that person in America when I happened to have to go to America for business um, and, and actually did the Tibetan rite to tell that person that they're dead and after I did that the, this ghost phenomenon ceased and strangely, and this is a weird karmic thing, we didn't really like each other in life, but I ended up being the person who had to inform him that he's dead. So the, I want to put that in a very real context, that this is not just theoretical. That's why you need to know these things and to understand the nature of death. And, you know, in Halloween where people are innocently conjuring spirits, I mean, not, not to try to sound like an evangelical mm -hmm. Christian, but by opening the door, you know, by even putting on a devil costume, most people don't know what they're doing when they do that. They are attracting uh, demonic and infernal forces that are very real. So if you're, you know, it, you've, for, for this one day on Halloween, you've got many millions of people in the West becoming the living dead or vampires or werewolves or Frankenstein's monster or some of the more modern horror figures, you, they are, we are conjuring up the dead and we are calling spirits, even, even if they wouldn't have come anyway because of this celestial rift that occurs on this date, uh, you're calling spiritual beings into play. So I just wanted to give that example. That's very real. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Now, one other thing I'll mention, like even today, you know, people think demons, ghosts are kind of quaint and funny and, and romantic and gothic. Even today, I talked to somebody who had an incubus experience in America, and they were frightened by it, or at least alarmed by it. And they were wondering, you know, you know, am I going crazy? Is this really happening? And then they were staying in a hotel. This just happened a few hours ago. Um, again, not theoretical, real. These things are happening all the time for people that are sensitive to them. And the they were staying in a hotel, and they heard somebody outside talking to someone they knew who was complaining that some spiritual force or ghost was touching them in their sleep in the next room in this hotel. So, you know, the, these things are happening. And, you know, that's, that's what in Halloween, in a kitschy way to deal with our fear about it, people are, are using costumes to try to come to terms with these spiritual forces, which are almost never paid attention to anymore in the Western world, except for these, you know, ridiculous psychic phenomena ghost hunting type shows which is garbage and actually very 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 misleading but yeah, so, I, so I wanted to give two examples of you know this is real um, ghosts are real but there's nothing fun or romantic about them they are literally human beings who don't realize that they're in they should be in the other bardo they are still clinging so much to their physical body and to this life, usually because they died violently or prematurely, they don't know they're dead. And so it's important for us in the mortal world, like you said, in the Tibetan tradition, the compassionate thing to do is is to not, not to lead a ghost on, though that might sound funny, but to tell them, you know you're dead, right? You You need to leave. You need to go. So... Just as I said, somebody who's listening to this, everyone should be aware of, you know, some people hearing this today will be dead tomorrow. Something will happen to somebody. 
somebody is going to encounter a, a supernatural force of some kind. So you should be aware. Ghosts should be told, you know, you, you're dead. You should leave. You don't, you don't need to be here anymore. Even if you're not trained to do it, you can have a compassionate conversation with a spirit that is trapped between the bardos. And I want to just jump in before we wade into the waters even more deeply here and mention that to my understanding and experience too, the souls that sometimes either the ones that don't know or the ones that do know and refuse to let go of the material life, they turn into what in some circles are called astral zombies. They start decomposing on the on the plane that's very close to the material plane. Absolutely. And it's really bad for them because they their minds also start to go too. Sure. Absolutely. That that's why it's necessary and why ancient cultures, traditional cultures rooted in some sort of spiritual legacy know to do the proper rites to send I mean in the, uh, actually on Halloween vampires, what are vampires? They exist. They're not elegant aristocrats floating around a castle. Uh, they are malevolent ghosts or supernatural beings that, on, in some cases, like in India, it's a very common tradition. There are, there are spiritual forces that fool people and trick them into thinking that they're gods. And, the, and because India believes in spiritual things in a way that the Western world doesn't, or at least some people there do. It's becoming rapidly uh, westernized as well. These beings need blood, and they need meat, and they will inhabit the body of somebody who died recently and reanimate it. There's no, And again, there's nothing glamorous or romantic or gothic about that. So, you know, a vampire is a real thing. It's a being a supernatural being that feeds on blood and death and meat. And actually, even there is a tradition, for instance, there's a very good book I can recommend that gets into this called The Food of the Bodhisattvas, which is a Buddhist text which talks about eating meat and, you know, ingesting the dead meat and blood of animals attracts these vampiric spirits to suck your energy out of you and leads to all kinds of Ayurvedic contextual illnesses that come from spiritual beings like like you know spiritual mosquitoes drawing your blood and your and your life essence from you and creating illnesses well and Nicholas another thing I've I've learned that I think you probably know a lot about is when black magicians or sorcerers realize that the end of their incarnation is near and i mean genuine ones not not the play actors that we see on the internet mm -hmm. um they often will not be willing to let go of being attached to this realm and its pleasures and so they become an especially insidious kind of vampire because they have certain mastery of an esoteric uh absolutely skill. absolutely that that I mean, you could refer to some something like that, that that is like a black bodhisattva, if you want to use that phrase. The, you know, if you, if you understand how the mind works, but you abuse it to perpetuate the ego rather than to dissolve the ego, and rather than developing universal compassion and understanding of emptiness, you, you grasp on to the ego with ferocity, Yes, a, a, a genuine black magician, if you want to use that phrase, could perpetuate their life and become that kind of vampiric being. And I have experience with that. I know that that's true. You're up. It's not. It's not just a fairy tale. That's not just supernatural fiction. That is actually possible, and it happens. But that's, you know, that's that shows the depth of ignorance to do that. To to hold on to this particular physical form. But that kind of being can become worshipped, like I said, as a by simple people could see that as a god when it, it's a false god. And then that gets into an even deeper, huger question. Who is this being that the Abrahamic religions call God? He is actually a being like that. As, as you know, the Demiurge, Ialdabaoth, 
is a, is a false god and is a vampiric god that lives off of blood and war and destruction and you know everything that the that the old testament recommends um so that's that's one way to look at it you know yahweh jehovah allah is that kind of false god on a very huge level but there that can happen on a, with a local spirit as well so that that is what happens when a black magician ego tries to perpetuate itself for eternity. It's very interesting and I can almost see people someone out there rubbing their hands together with dollar signs in their eyes thinking about uh, how can I capitalize on this whole black buddy sofa thing that I just learned about. There must be a course I can run on how to con- connect. Oh, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure somebody is. I'm almost loath to talk about it too much because whatever is the worst path is the one that people will be attracted to always. But but it does have to. So I mean, what are vampires? They exist. There are they, at the moment somebody dies, a malevolent spirit who wants to come into the physical world and enjoy the play. I mean, even gods come into as as every mythology shows you. They want to come into this mortal world and experience physical pleasures that are not exactly the same in the spiritual world. Mm-hmm. So that exists. But there's nothing glamorous or romantic about any of that about being a ghost and just to bring a different counterpoint to it for those people that might be thinking that this might be a good career path for them there are other good forces that counterbalance this i mean um in the book the night terrors i believe um there's a there's a description of how among the Slavic countries, at least, there are these um, basically sh- shamans who would shapeshift, who would become werewolves, and they would actually hunt out beings like this and demons and and fight them back into the hell realms. Right. So there are natural. This you don't get to just hover around and be like this. There are no, forces. no. There, there, there are cosmic forces, and I would not say good or evil. But there are there are forces of compassion and there are forces of selfishness, and and the funny I mean I was going to get into that too. So we've talked about what are ghosts really, what are vampires really, and werewolves too. In ancient traditions, are not an entirely demonic or evil being. Very often, the wolf, you know, in many Native American traditions, northern traditions, is not at all seen as a malevolent. The the werewolf is like a warrior almost like a wrathful deity. Not always, but many times the, the wolf or the werewolf or lycanthrope archetype is a positive one that fights demonic beings. So, yeah, we have to be careful to look at the most ancient traditions of these things. That's very interesting. And um, I think you made a good point earlier where people may be, um, they may think that they are worshiping gods or working with gods when in fact they are working with tortured spirits or what you would call maybe demons um the even the neoplatonists uh, the theurgists talk about if you are in a degenerate state you you can't even know the higher beings because there's no connection so the gods that you think you are working with are actually very well could be something like a demon well, I can speak from my own ignorance in my youth. What was the first, as a child, the first thing I was attracted to were the demonic forces, not the positive right. ones. And and there they were. They they if you conjure them, they will be there. There, it's like it's like opening your. It's like uh, they are the criminals of the spiritual world. They're, you know, uh, just like burglars and robbers are waiting to see if your door or window is open to break in. These maras or malevolent beings are waiting for foolish mortals to to call on them so that they can come stir up trouble in this world. So yeah, and now that, another important point that that reminds me of is spiritualism, and especially these days, people do a lot of naive communication with ghosts or trying to call on their ancestors yes. or like the modern form of, of table wrapping and spiritualism in the 19th century. A very important point is do not think that somebody who died has some kind of wisdom just because they are incorporeal form. On the contrary, that is, you know, as you said, they could be astrally rotting 
they they could be losing their consciousness by being stuck between the bardo. So it's a very odd idea that people think just because you know Uncle Bob died yesterday that suddenly he should be your moral guardian from beyond because he's still Uncle Bob except he's a confused Uncle Bob in another world who doesn't realize he's dead. So it's very weird the fetishization of the dead and the assumption that they have a wisdom that that's not who you should be going for for spiritual advice. I think that's important to add. Yeah, and uh, I mean it's almost fashionable nowadays in some circles to work with ghosts and, and the dead and I mean, there were there were uh, legitimate sorceress um, techniques of antiquity where that was the case, but um, now you have almost soccer moms. You know, between picking the kids up from from school, they're gonna oh, they're gonna sure. call on a demon or the undead at a graveyard to you know help them with X Y Z. Um, what do you think about that sort of modern phenomenon? <laughs> Well, obviously, it's completely egotistical and selfish, and and using spirits in itself is is karmically damaging. But you know, the the soccer mom or or even a well educated person who thinks they're a great mystic or magician, their ego is blinding them to what they're doing. So, as you said about the ancient theurgists, if you're impure, you're going to call upon impure spirits. You will not even notice the beneficial or auspicious ones so they're playing with fire but i know from experience you can warn people about that they will never ever ever believe it people that want to play with demons and satan and these things and or and they even have the arrogance to say well they're not real they're just symbols they're just uh archetypes you know they are absolutely destroying themselves and playing with fire but I know there's no point in warning people like that because the obscurations, the karmic obscurations, prevent them from seeing the harm of what they're doing. So, Nicholas, in terms of the... We talked about this world being a bardo, but you've also used the word bardo in the plural. For our listeners, what do the other bardos look like? Right. Well, there's this, this one that we're in, the bardo of living. There's the bardo of, medita- of the meditative state of dhyana or, or shamatha. There's a state of consciousness that comes from meditation, or you could say of dharma practice. That is a state of consciousness. There is the bardo of dreams, which we all experience. And, and that is a very good test run for death. Dreaming is very much like a certain aspect of of what will happen when the mind is freed from the body because anything can happen in the same way to use the uh, western phrase the subconscious becomes manifest when you're dreaming when your spirit has left your body and is in the painful bardo of death uh, you whatever you're thinking will be there's like within within less than a split second if you think of something when your spirit's no longer in your body, it's there. And that that's why it's very important to control your mind and tame your mind while it is still contained in this physical vessel. Then there's the transcendent luminous bardo that you could say is enlightenment. That's another bardo. And within, within the four or six bardos, depending on which system you want to look at, uh, there are many subcategories. For instance, and this is important to know, that in, in the tantric tradition, if you, the moment of death could become the moment of enlightenment and liberation if you understand how to use it properly. It could be the permanent moment of liberation if you have been trained and meditated properly on it and you waited for it and you knew what to do. But if you cannot become liberated at that moment, there is a tradition called poa, which you can learn while you are in a physical body, and you requ- it requires particular empowerments from a master who is qualified to teach this system of poa. You can then, when your body, when when your consciousness leaves your body, you can do a practice that will send you your spirit permanently to what is called the pure land 
in Japan, most of what Buddhism is is this pure land or Amitaya uh, Buddhism. But this is one particular practice in the Vajrayana Tantric system, and the pure land is a realm of consciousness or a kind of sub bardo in which if you are not fully liberated you can at least do this practice and go there until you become liberated and this bardo is created by a particular bodhisattva out of compassion for beings who aren't gained enough to become fully enlightened or liberated i think very people have even heard of that that's another level of consciousness and there in the in the so-called pure land uh, which is no more real or less real than this consciousness state that we are in now you can get the teachings required for as long as it takes to become enlightened or liberated and you will never fall from that state back into the so-called lower realms of human animal demon ghost that's very interesting and so as you mentioned earlier, um, no one ever knows when they will be transitioning. It could be tomorrow, it could be today, it could be one week. So practically speaking, most of us are not going to have the, the good fortune to have someone at their bedside reading you know, the Tibetan Book of the Dead or whatnot to, to help mm-hmm. them along. What are some practical steps that someone could take now to best prepare themselves uh, for that moment well not not to be frightened of death to understand that the, that you have already died billions of times you've already been through this process there's absolutely nothing to fear and this may be hard to grasp but at the moment of death and for that 49 day period or what feels like a 49 day period from an earthly perspective your mind has nine times the power of what it has on earth so you will have what would seem to be psychic abilities of telepathy and all of that that comes with the mind working perfectly without all the obscurations that the physical body kind of um, prevents it and limits it from using so there's absolutely nothing to fear about death and you cannot avoid it there's nothing there's absolutely nothing and i know someone out there who's actually today i talked to them who's actually terrified of death and the main lesson for for that person and for anybody is there's nothing to fear and this may be hard to grasp but at the moment of death you will understand it because your mind will be operating on a higher level what is frightening is to keep coming back to this world of birth, old age, sickness, and death again and again. It is not frightening to for the consciousness to leave the body. So and 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 secondarily, I think this is an important thing. It may not be understood by everyone, but if you contemplate it on a deeper level, the spiritual tradition which I am initiated in, the Karma Kaju school of tantric buddhism the the leader of that sect is uh the karmapa and the 16th karmapa who died in 1981 there now is the 17th karmapa when he was dying one of his disciples was crying and upset he was dying in a hospital in chicago and he showed absolutely no pain though he had cancer he was laughing joyful not fearing death at all and this disciple was crying and he said to him the words nothing happens and that is true here in this world that we're in and in the next world and in all the different bardos and worlds nothing is actually happening so there is actually nothing to fear and i know that will be hard for most people to grasp but it's important to contemplate and think about that. And that that gets into sunyata, mm-hmm. or what is translated as emptiness. Nothing is actually happening but consciousness. Everything that you are experiencing, good, bad, or indifferent, however you judge it to be, is your own consciousness reflected back at you. 
So all that is happening is consciousness. And then if we go deeper, what is consciousness? What is thought? What is mind? Where do you locate it? Where do you find it? It actually doesn't exist. We have a subjective experience of it, but it actually is not existent. So ultimately, there is nothing to fear if you can grasp the subtleties of that. Interesting. Yeah, you, you, it reminded me of the, the Heart Sutra, what you were saying. And then, of course, you said sunyata, so <laughs> there was that connection there. Well, emptying the, the, heart, the, the main message of the Heart Sutra, which is the Mahayana tradition, uh, emptiness is form, form is emptiness. So we, we perceive and our senses perceive a physical world, but it is empty. It is not actually existent. Mm-hmm. It's like a shimmering mirage. And this, this is why the rainbow is a metaphor that's used in Tantric Buddhism. The, you, we see the rainbow, we see the vivid colors of it, but can you touch it? You see it, it's there, but like our body in the dream, it's not fully existent either. It's, a, it's kind of a trick of the mind. And that, that's what everything we are experiencing is. The entirety of this universe is consciousness. So if nothing is happening, there is nothing to fear. One thing I want to get into here just for a quick minute is this idea of look, now is the only thing that's real, to quote um, to quote somebody who said that once. Right. In the Richard sense Alpert. That, yeah. <laughs> So, well, he um, he got it. He got it from some guru in India. Yeah, and, and and we have to really focus in on that point. The thing that scares me about death is not death. Death doesn't scare me. Um, what scares me is not having a beneficial con- contribution to this realm before I pass from this existence. Because right. the, the opportunity to be incarnate is such a privilege. And we shouldn't squander it on senselessness. Yes, well, that that gets into karma, specifically. Most people will totally squander, I mean, what I said before, the precious or noble human birth. To have the good fortune, you must have good karma to be born into this world where it is possible to become enlightened. And there are certain conditions... Uh, that I won't explain right here because it's too lengthy, that make for a noble human birth or a precious human birth. But to have the good... Uh, one metaphor for this that I can think of is that a, a tantric teaching is that the ability to be born into this world is as rare as a tortoise in the ocean its shell rising and perfectly rising into a bubble above it that will fit it perfectly. That's a metaphor for how rare it is to be born into this particular world where we have the opportunity to contemplate wisdom and to become enlightened. On the other hand, another tantric teacher has put across the idea that think of this life as could just be a brief vacation from the hell realms we could have come from there and we could be going right back to the hell realms and they exist and they are many there it's not just like the abrahamic idea of one hell there are many different kinds of hell dependent on the negative karma you bring into that so to answer your question of how not to squander this life karma and mindfulness of your actions is the key Every thought, every word, and every action you make has karmic weight. And when, and karma again is such a misunderstood word, like Bardo. Um, it just means there are con- absolute consequences to every action, thought, and speech. And you need to watch all of those things carefully, which is why mindfulness, mindfulness and being aware that there is only now is crucial. Full awareness of what are you saying? What are you doing? What are you thinking? And what are the consequences of each action you make? 
if you know that that is the key to understand you're going to make your next life based on the decisions you make right now every habit you have every process of thought that you keep pursuing every action you make you are creating the next life for yourself because of impermanence we can create a much better more auspicious rebirth and could even become liberated or enlightened if we fully understood karma and if we fully purified and accepted that we are responsible for our next life that we are not just thrown into it by some random force we are writing the script of our next life just as whoever we were before and before that and before that and before that wrote the script for who we have become now so karma is the key taking karma totally 100 percent seriously i i couldn't agree more i i find personally that people who are more western leaning spiritually they don't like this whole idea of karma because it is it's an eastern thing it's an eastern idea that's not part of the western tradition you know maybe it makes sense but i'm not incorporating that into my practice because that's not part of what i do oh i've 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 met people who very arrogantly think if they don't believe in it it doesn't right. uh it's it's like saying i don't i don't believe in electricity or gravity therefore it doesn't affect me but it is as absolutely real and an objective an experience as electricity or gravity so it also shows their ignorance because this was taught by the most archaic roots in the of the western tradition we know that it was part of the pythagorean tradition for instance it's in Abs uh, esoteric judaism judaism i mean it's there well you shall reap what you shall sow you know so i mean there that should be understood it's it's a, it's part of every spiritual tradition no matter the theological differences uh yeah karma i mean but the, i think even the word just sounds yeah. exotic and eastern to most westerners and therefore they reject it as some sort of hippie idea that has nothing to do with reality it's very simple if you think something you are making that happen if you say it you're making it even more real and if you do it for instance if you think i hate so and so you you are generating hatred against yourself if you say out loud i hate you you are you are making it deeper it's called it's a heavier karma and then if you kill somebody you hate you've created an extremely negative karma and similarly with love if you genuinely think i love you and you really do and it's not just empty words and you express it and you manifest it that would create positive karma if it was true love and not just attachment or or exploitation so that's that's how we do, that's what we must focus on is forget the word karma you know if it turns westerners off because it's too eastern your actions all have consequences absolutely everything you say do and think has consequences forever and you can purify your negative karma but for the most part we are selfishly accruing worse and worse and worse karma that will give ourselves a worse life and as the dalai lama has said because human beings are naturally selfish it's actually you can use your selfishness to think i don't want to end up in the hell realm therefore i will work on purifying my karma because most people can't be compassionate and altruistic without knowing what's in it for them right we can use that weakness of the human mind against itself yes that would definitely be expedient means yes right absolutely absolutely so we kind of um touched just now on the western mystery tradition and i wanted to ask you i think you would be somebody who is one of the most qualified people right now in the in in the world maybe to talk on this point but i personally and this is just my personal understanding i tend to associate both set and osiris with this season with the season of scorpio and halloween and the god set taken out of the vilification that occurred to him really is a god also of initiation and the mysteries but he's all some of that process has to do with the direct confrontation with death um and the confrontation with terror 
as a purification. And I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit on that. Yeah, but briefly, because yeah, I, th- I think that would lead us into whole other levels. I think one thing to say is that the Egyptian or Kemite understanding of the death process is remarkably similar to the Tantric Vajrayana tradition in the and this I'll get into how that ties into Set. In the Tantric tradition and even in the Pan Indian tradition of many of much Indian mysticism, there are five elements to consciousness called the skandhas. And then at the moment our consciousness leaves our body, these five skandhas separate. And actually People don't realize you are reincarnated five times, not just once, but each of these skandhas, unless you are a highly developed tulku who has mastered consciousness completely, these five skandhas that came together as you will separate and become other beings. So there, you don't, you're not just reborn into one body. Five aspects of you are reborn into several different bodies and forms. And then in the Egyptian tradition, there are seven aspects or pillars of consciousness that separate. People know the Ka and the Kabit, probably. You know what I'm talking about. And that's very similar, the process that you go through. And then just as in the tantric tradition you confront yama the god of death who judges you and and with black pebbles and white pebbles actually at least metaphorically or symbolically says look at how many black pebbles of negative karma how many white pebbles of positive karma and judges what you will become i mean you've created this reality for yourself similarly the ancient egyptians understood that set was the guardian of death and would you you your next life or where you would go in the afterworld would be dependent on a test from this challenger or terrifier set similarly set was a very sexual being but he did not procreate he did not have children only the child he had was toth who was born in a unnatural way and and that's wisdom the the god of wisdom um similar so death and life as the opposite of each other but also flip sides of the same coin in ancient egypt for primitive birth control there would be a stone that women would put inside of them before they had intercourse that would have an image of set on it and it would represent set and that would prevent coming into this world just as he at the end he's there to escort you when you go into the other world so that is one aspect of set as the initiator well and there's also the association of the dryness of the desert as opposed to kind of the the abundance of life near the water of of the nile right well, that, that has a whole other symbolism. But to, I mean, there's so many aspects of set, you could do an entire show right. on only that. But I think what you referred to especially, the every, okay, you, you mentioned Osiris, so let's limit it to that for this evening. Um, it's like what Goethe writes about Mephistopheles, the force that is evil that does good. If you look at the Egyptian mythology, it looks like Set is only causing trouble, killing people, damaging things. But out of all of his apparently destructive and terrifying action, he actually is the protagonist that makes everything happen. So with Osiris, he kills Osiris, but by killing him, he shows the formula for a mortal life. And this gets into a little bit like if I'm sure you are both aware of the the uh, Gospel of Judas, where yes. Judas is a necessary force in the actual Christian initiatory system, in that it's required for Judas to betray Jesus for him to be reborn, which of course is not just a physical rebirth, but initiatory rebirth on a higher level. 
this is what Set does with Osiris. By killing him, and, and then he's cut into different parts, that is a, like a shamanic initiatory rebirth process. So Set creates immortality, and Set rapes, you know, but creates the god of wisdom. So... That's interesting, and, and I'm glad you. I was exactly thinking of Judas. I wonder if we talked about this on one of our other episodes, but uh, even maybe, on a mund- maybe in a past life, not in this. True. <laughs> <laughs> even in a, a mundane Christian way, Judas is still the one that makes it happen. Um, not not even talking about the Gnostic versions of of his story. Right. You can you can look at the at the es- or the exoteric Christianity, yeah. and it, it's still quite clear. The, without Pontius Pilate, there's no resurrection. You know, you could look at mm-hmm. it that way, and right. that 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 is partially. I mean, Set's a very deep subject, but that that is the the cosmic force that Set represents. It seems chaotic, terrible, and negative and frightening. That is the quality of Set, but it actually creates everything that is positive. It makes things happen. Without so a little bit, I, I don't want to make this comparison too exactly, but sort of like Loki in his relation to the northern pantheon, nothing would happen without Loki causing the trouble he causes. And like the trickster in every single spiritual tradition, Seth's seemingly chaotic, negative, uh, destructive, or terrifying activity creates positive changes. So. It's like the forest fire that destroys a destroys a forest, and then all this new growth comes. Exactly, that's a perfect metaphor. So, so Nicholas, we've been talking about a lot of heavy topics as we do with you, which is our favorite thing to do. But um, I, I think it might be important to also look at the role of humor uh, in all of this. What's your perspective? Well, what comes to mind is the Sanskrit phrase "lila." which means the playfulness of the gods. And, and that is extremely necessary for initiates and mystics to cultivate. In fact, you shouldn't have to cultivate it. If, if we get back to what I was discussing, if you understand that nothing happens, that this experience, this phenomena that we, we have of consciousness is not even existent, that it's a dreamlike illusion then that, that's hilarious, actually. That is a cosmic joke. And then we can take a very graceful, light approach to living. And actually, even though we can take it seriously on one hand, how can we possibly take it seriously on another? So that is, this quality, Leela, is not really part of Western thinking, but it means literally the playfulness of the gods. Because the gods, the diva, beings can basically do anything life is joyful and playful it isn't a serious grim uh, fatal process it's it's a game and I think anyone who genuinely understands the mystical experience and non-dualism, non-dualism understands the humor of our situation even though it could be very grim humor but you know human life is ultimately absurd and but that i don't mean in a bitter or sarcastic way it is joyful to see the nature of reality so humor is very important component in actual magical and mystical process and even even to be could be a good magician let alone a transcendent uh liberated initiate or adept um even to be a good magician you have to have to understand it's a game you have to look at it with the playfulness of a child and the imagination of a child to, to understand how magic works. So, yeah, humor is absolutely essential. And Set, Loki, Tezcatlipoca, these trickster beings are humorists in many ways, even though their humor could be black humor. Well, and you know what's funny is the trickster always tells the truth but is accused of being a liar. Absolutely. Yeah, well, that, I mean, like the court jester can can say something to the king that you know is true, but you, you choose to take it as a joke. So that's the flip side of the same phenomenon. And I can't help but thinking about um, the voodoo loi uh, 
Baron Samedi. Yeah, he, he is very important to me. As you may know, I had an experience with him in Haiti when I was very young. So, yeah, he's a very similar being. And he laughs a lot. And his the spirits with him are often joking. Right. Well, he's the, he's a perfect god to end on for this Halloween episode, the god of the cemetery, the lord of the of the graveyard. And yeah, he's joyful in the midst of death. Well, Nicholas, as usual, thank you so much. We're always honored to have you on and we treasure you not only as a guest but as a friend. You're I think that you your message is very important in the era we're in and also i have said before i think that your voice is reaching people who might not normally be exposed to the ideas that you're sharing and that is very important i i really have come to believe that's part of my mission here wherever i came here is to reach people who normally would never be exposed to this i think if there's any yeah, any value that can come from the life I've lived, it's that. So I agree with you. That and some great death rock. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for having me, and a happy Halloween to everyone. And remember, there is nothing to fear in death because nothing happens. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was the ever intriguing Nicholas Shrek uh, pontificating for his Halloween Dharma teaching for all of you. We, as usual, are elated to have had him on the show again. We think he is the ideal Halloween guest. Nicholas has a certain incisive acumen where he cuts through a lot of over intellectual terminology uh, to really get to the heart of of what's going on. And I think it's important because a lot of the things we're discussing, it's beyond Buddhism or Christianity or Egyptian religion or shamanism or magic or anything. And sometimes we need to, I think, view things from the viewpoint of ultimate reality. And what greater reality than when you die, what you go through, what you have to face and what you experience. So for that reason, I personally am grateful for him coming on the podcast, discussing these matters. Hopefully, it will give people some pause to consider their own passing, whenever that may be, and engage in the practice of memento mori. I love that he's our reoccurring Halloween guest. It's just so cool. He's, he's such an interesting character, and we always have so much fun talking with him, and he's always very insightful. It's always a, a hit with listeners when he's on the show. So I'm, I'm super grateful that he decided to come on again. Um, we're just going to keep the, you know, the tradition going as long as we can. Uh, and yeah, he is very knowledgeable about all sorts of things and he, he makes it very accessible. He, he does cut out a lot of the more technical jargon that isn't necessarily necessary in order to actually cut to the heart of, of the message. So I love uh, listening to him talk about these things. So just another great um, Nicholas Shrek episode. Absolutely. And hopefully everyone will have an excellent Halloween or Walpurgisnacht or Sawen or whatever you, Day of the Dead, Day of All Saints, however you celebrate it. You have an entire month. The season of sex, death, and regeneration begins at the onset of Scorpio, October 21st, and concludes at the end of that period when the sun moves into Sagittarius. So you have a month, and uh, during the next month, I would recommend ancestor veneration, visiting the cemetery to see deceased loved ones, leaving out offerings, contemplating your own death, working with deities of death and regeneration or spirits of death and regeneration and um, things Saturnian. Yeah, yeah, no, this is a good time to work with those deities that um, live in that liminal space like Hermes, Hecate, Anubis, 
this is a good time to to work with them. I think. In in addition to what you just said about ancestor veneration and and, and those kind of things. So our book this year, this this Halloween season, our book review is a book called The Darkling, a treatise on Slavic vampirism by Jan L. Perkowski. Um, this writer, while he was pursuing folklore work in eastern Canada, he actually stumbled upon a vampire cult. And he ended up being invited to do a series of lectures and the establishment, he established a college course called Vampires of the Slavs. And so this is a monograph um, written in a scholarly way. However, it is accessible on the Slavic origins of the vampire myth and the development of the vampire. And it also is interesting because he compares the shift from fiction to folklore in the vampire myth to the development of the myth of uh, St. Nicholas from the Bishop of Myra to Santa Claus. So he does this contrasting thing in one chapter. Um, In the second chapter, he goes into the origins of the European vampire and word and concept. And then as it progresses, he also goes into the idea of uh, daemon or spirit contamination, which is very common in early vampire literature, Um, different kinds of demons, which might also be uh, inspirations for the vampire myth. And um, then in the final chapter, he goes into an analysis of 15 Slavic folkloric vampire texts, including the transcription of an 18th century vampire trial. So it's a very interesting book. It even goes into the psychological underpinnings of vampire beliefs and the way they're transmitted among people, the role of dreams in vampirism, and then there's a multilingual bi- biography in the back. Um, so this is a very interesting book. If you find the subject of vampires interesting, this may be the go-to resource for that. And the name and author once again? The Darkling, a treatise on Slavic vampirism by Jan J.A.N.L. Perkowski. It is available on Amazon. It's, it's very good. I think especially if it were read in combination with Nigel Jackson's book, The Complete Vampire, which is also a recommended resource for people who are interested in the subject of vampirism. I think that this this would be some very interesting reading, um, but if you're subject to nightmares or a sensitivity like that, I would definitely recommend that you don't read it before you go to sleep at night. Personally, I didn't find it disturbing, but some people are more sensitive than me. Okay, thanks for that little disclaimer. Sounds great. We definitely need to have an episode on Slavic folklore and magic um, at oh, some yeah. point. Oh, yeah, it's in the work, works for sure. All right, so you guys can find us on Stitcher, YouTube, iTunes, um, Podbean, most places that podcasts are available. As always, thank you to everyone who supports this podcast, this labor of love. And um, again, thank you to Nicholas for so graciously sharing his time and insight and wisdom. Yep. Okay. That's very well said. I think that's all that needs to be said. We will see you all in the next episode. Bye.